Good morning. Um, so we are from Sanford and we work in total rewards there. Uh, my name is Cassie Van Wyk. My name is um, I started working at Stanford about six years ago. Um, I started as an intern and I gave, um, I went into compensation shortly after my internship ended and I've been in compensation ever since. Yep. And I also started as an intern five years ago. Um, we actually interned together and I was still in school. So I went back to school and then came back after that. Um, but we started as file interns, so really, really boring work. Um, but we got to know a lot about the company, a lot about the employees. And then we both, I also started in total rewards and benefits. So still part of the same department, just a little bit different starting functions. Mm -hmm. Um, I started out in HR when I was in high school or my interest in HR came from high school. So I was able to do like a capstone internship as one of my classes. And I did it at a local hospital and loved it. So it's not something that I knew a whole lot about because I'm from a small town. Um, but once you kind of dive into HR, like you're the person that gets to help all the employees in the company do their job better. So I loved it. Um, so when I was a junior in college, I received an email about an internship through Stanford and it really piqued my interest. So I applied for it. Um, I got the job and through the, in, like through the, uh, to know of all the employees they company culture the people who take care of them. Yeah, and like I said, my first exposure. I grew up in my family, so my family went to Stanford to do balance degrees and sports as much as they went to what they did. And when I was in college, they came to both several times and got job fairs um, at the two companies, but we're all kind of able to get exposure to you know who they were and be part of that. So what steps helped us get to where we are today? So I mentioned, started out as an intern. I was really active in college, all throughout my grad, um, you know, several student organizations, lots of job fairs, you know, to go, go out and meet to recruiters. And then I set my sights on HR at Sanford. So I kind of had to wait for openings, which is why I also did another internship after I graduated and then before I transitioned over to our benefits role. Yeah. Um, so when we were interns, um, we had multiple departments come and speak to us, um, and I went to every single one of them just to, you know, see, like, what departments do, what they're about, what their day-to-days kind of look like, and when compensation came to talk to us, I was, it piqued my interest, it was very interesting, and, um, you know, what helped me get there is, you know, I kept an open mind, even though, you know, Sometimes you go into things not really knowing what to expect, but um, sometimes you just got to take that leap of, leap of faith. And we, neither of us actually wanted to start out in total rewards. No. It's not something that you typically think about when you think of HR. Usually, at least for me, it was recruiting. So for a while, I wanted to be a recruiter. And then when I learned more about human resources, I wanted to do employee relations. So the people working with employee issues, um, you know, helping them through hard times. But that is very different from my role today. And I'm happy for it. So you just kind of don't know what you want until you're in it sometimes. Um, so when I first started, I also wanted to be in employee relations. But um, the more you learn about it, you're kind of just like that just doesn't sound like something I want to do personally. I didn't have to deal with all the drama um, and having to, you know, navigate through those waters. Um, but compensation really, it's, it's my home, I would say. Um, so um, I would say my favorite part about my job with compensation is that we get to give out increases to people and who doesn't love getting an increase? So that's a really good part of it. We also do a lot of work in Excel spreadsheets, coming up with costings, 
to see how much giving out increases are going to cost. And we also work very closely with our HR strategic partners. So um, helping our strategic partners make um, smart decisions. Um, you really get um, a strategic side of it. And it's not just like you come in, do your work, and then do the same thing over and over again. Uh, and my role specifically now has transitioned to um, the retirement plans with Ms. Sanford. So I manage all of those and I love it because everyone works. I mean, even now, although we're, um, you know, towards the beginning of our careers, you're working towards that end goal. You're working towards retirement. So it's important right away when you start, it's important in the middle, it's important in the end. So helping and educate employees, help them understand. And then finally, when I help them hit that goal, of retirement, it is just so rewarding to hear them like, oh, I'm retiring next week and, you know, hear about their plans and all of that. Um, the hardest part of my job similar, similarly is working with people that do not have the retirement savings that they want or hoped to have. Um, you know, although it's usually your biggest account, um, employees, people, participants don't always keep track of that. So they think that they might have this account out there from 30 years ago when they worked for us and they don't. So it's really hard to communicate that with them and to help them accept it. Because if you're relying on that money that you think you might have and you've moved it elsewhere and I can't necessarily tell you where that is because it's no longer with us, that's a difficult conversation and it happens a lot. Um, the hardest part with compensation is, you know, you want to do so much for your employees, but you only have a specific bucket of money that you're allotted every year. So um, the hardest part is trying to figure out what to do with that money and how we can essentially get the most bang for a buck. How many employees can we touch with this pot of money that we have to spend throughout the year? Um, is there anything that I regret about my job? Um, no. There's really nothing I regret about my job. Um, and I also don't regret taking my job. Um, I think, you know, when you go to start looking for jobs, you really have to kind of take a look at yourself and say, what do I want for the job? And um, really think about that as you're doing your job interviews and being mindful of those questions that you're asking at your interviews. So like, is this a good fit for me? Um, I would echo that. We both took our time to find it. You know, we had other offers when we graduated college and chose to wait um, for something we felt was right for us. So, you know, and I'm sure you've seen it too with friends that have graduated or have started out. But if you hop to that first job right away, your first offer, although you might like the salary, there might be other things that you don't like. So make sure you look at the whole picture, ask those insightful questions during the interviews. So you really know what culture you're getting into because you know, if you're making a lot, but you're working all the time and have no work-life balance, that might not be worth it to you. But like we'll mention later all throughout this is everything is a personal decision. You have to do what's right for you, but just make sure you're taking the time to do so. Um, the most difficult part of working with people is, I mean, it's human nature. We all think we're right. Um, so convincing individuals that, you know, they may not have all the information um, can be really challenging, especially when you can't necessarily show them everything. So I would say that's the hardest part for me. Mm -hmm. um, also, working with people, you know, you also have to depend on other people, mm -hmm. especially when you're working with projects, you have to um, have trust that they're going to get their part of the project done. I mean, you guys all know this with group projects. Um, I mean, it stays in the workplace, you work together. Um, I don't think we have issues with it on our team, but you know, you are working with other departments and you know, sometimes you have to send four or five follow-up emails just to make sure you get the part done. Um, what does an everyday schedule look like for us? Um, we're, I'm in a lot of meetings day to day. Sometimes I get pulled into random meetings. Um, I will open up my email, kind of look at through my emails, prioritize what needs to get done. Um, right now, we're in, in my favorite part of the time is we're looking through market increases. So again, giving out increases. We do, a, we do market increases um, once a year, and then we do a merit increase once a year as well. So we do our market increase first, and then we do our merit increase. Um, so right now, it's a lot of working through spreadsheets, 
kind of having people hop on a meeting with me, kind of going through the spreadsheet, making sure our calculations are correct and that we're distributing the money as equally as possible. Uh, one of my favorite parts of my job is that no two days are alike, which is great. Um, so you don't have that, you know, ending work, but also it's hard to predict and hard to schedule because I'm also in a lot of meetings with our retirement funders, with our teams, um, both within total rewards and the rest of Stanford. So like our payroll, our finance teams. Um, but you have to fit the work in between that too. So when I first started in this role, it was kind of challenging. I was just like, man, there's just no time like during the work day to get this all done, but you find your balance. Um, so for me right now, what a current day looks like, um, meetings with our team, of course. Um, I am working through audits on our retirement accounts for last year to make sure everyone received the full employer match that they should have. And then we're also terminating two of our plans. So I'm working through that and making sure that all of our employees are ready and have been communicated with. Um, the skill that I rely on most to perform my job, I would say is communication. Um, it's essential. So I work with a lot of external teams, a lot of vendors. Um, and if I'm not communicating what Sanford needs, what I need from them, it's just not going to get done. They do a lot of our plan documents. They are the ones that are directly working with our employees. So I need to make sure that that's just a constant flow of communication with them, with myself, and then with the leaders in our organization as well. Um, skills that I rely on is attention to detail, uh, because when you're in a spreadsheet and you have your columns go to like BC and your rows go all the way down to like 15,000 you're and you have complex formulas and all of them you really want to make sure that like when you go through your spreadsheets that you're looking at everything and making sure it all looks correct because when you roll out increases you got to make sure that they are correct because if you roll out an increase that's too big you can't take that back and if you roll out an increase that's too small well it is a positive message to say, oh, yeah, it was too low. We're going to give you a bigger increase. It's still not as good. You want to make sure when you roll stuff out, it's pulled out correctly. Um, and I would say I do have a, a good strength with attention to detail. I also have strengths with multitasking because sometimes you're going to have to start with one project, hop to another one, and you're going to have to give it your full attention. So yeah, I would say managing multiple priorities is a strength that I have and we also have to have for our job. So if you aren't able to shift focus, you might be, you know, eyebrows deep in an audit and you have to hop out to go to a call that's completely separate um, and you still need to be able to pick that up again right after or when you have time later on. Okay, so on to the HR position questions. So do you think HR specific roles are beneficial to a business? Um, yes, I do. So I was um, I just stepped down in January, but part of the Sue Empire Sherm board. So that is Society for Human Resource Managers. And we worked with um, a lot of different companies. Um, there's HR professionals from all over and, you know, there's a student chapter if you're interested in it as well. But, you know, we saw companies that were very small and that didn't have an HR presence and they had to contract the work out to an HR consultant. Um, or large companies like ours, we have over 500 people in human resources alone because of the size of Stanford. Um, that's not true for every company, but typically the rule of thumb is every 100 employees equals one HR um, person, so. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's important um, to have HR specific roles because, you know, we, I know people say it, HR isn't your friend, but we really are. We are here to help you. We're also here to make sure that, you know, the business is up and running. Um, but, you know, especially with a lar as large of a business as Sanford has, I mean, we have about 50,000 employees. Um, it's nice to have like so many um, HR employees in there because we have an employee service center, which means, you know, any employee can call into there. And then from there, they can find um, someone in a different department that can help them with their specific question. 
um, and you become specialized in that topic. So that way, you know, when an employee is transferred over to compensation or benefits, we should be the last stop and we should be able to answer their question. Uh, an important thing to note is human resources functions are done at all companies, whether or not they have a specific person in the role. So, you know, payroll has to be paid. A lot of times that falls within human resources. You have to hire people into jobs. You have to help them through their benefits. You have to, you know, work through employee issues. So if there's not an HR specific role at the company, other people are doing that. But when there is, you know, defined roles, um, they're really, you know, more strategic, more thought out. It's not just people doing random duties that were assigned. It's more intentional and more compliant. Okay, so within total rewards, we kind of broke your questions out into what falls under benefits, what's full rewards, and then compensations. We'll just kind of go across with these questions. So we decide which benefits to give employees based off surveys and what other companies are doing. You'll kind of hear that a lot through these questions, but most employers participate in surveys. That's how we find out what other companies um, in the same industry or similar industry and similar size of us are doing. Um, so we look at you know, what's there. We also survey our employees um, directly to see what's important to them. Recently, we found that you know, there was a huge desire for a family policy, a family leave policy. So we implemented a week off and that's for you know, caring for anyone in your family, if that's tagged on to a maternity leave, a paternity leave, or if you're just helping your mom uh, recover from a surgery, all of those, you know, are included in that. So it's not just catering to one demographic, it's catering to all of our employees. Um, then we'll skip over to rewards next. So have either of you worked with recognition points before? So we do um, not, we don't specifically do recognition points. We do it's very important to recognize employees so we do that we're able to recognize each other as employees through nominations for awards such as employee of the year um, within hr we have gratitude awards which it's always really nice to hear you know someone nominating you for one of those and it's also posted on our um, workday page which is our hr system so if someone looks you up they can see all of the things so like I, I was nominated for employee of the year a couple of years ago. So that's listed on there. Any gratitude awards are listed on there. So it's, you know, people can see that. And it's also a constant reminder to you um, for that. Yeah, it's really nice to get those um, when you get them. They kind of remind you, yep, you're doing a good job. Um, so I support the Good Samaritan Society. Good Samaritan Society came over to Sanford 2019. So I support um, Good Samaritan Society and Sioux Falls. So Good Samaritan Society did have a type of recognition points. They called them the SAMI points. Um, if you clocked in on time, you got 10 points. If you um, didn't miss a shift, you got 10 points. So they had a version of that. We did essentially go away with it just because um, we have other ways to incentivize our employees. We have incentive points. We use one-time payments. And so we kind of told them rather than doing these point systems, you can just kind of like tally them up at the end of the month and then just give them a one-time payment for the end, like a bonus at the end of the um, end of the month, end of the year, kind of up to them. So um, it also kind of gives each location um, their, like they can kind of use it as they will because um, we don't want to fit everyone inside one box. Um, so with compensation, um, what do you think is the most significant factor in rewarding compensation? Um, well, when you think of compensation, you obviously think of your base rate of pay. Um, I would say the most significant factor when you know deciding what it is, is again, we go to our salary surveys. We participate in salary surveys every year and the surveys that we participate in are gonna tell us what the market value for a job for a hospital setting in a non-for-profit area. So we take those surveys and we really evaluate them and see, you know, what should we be paying this job and that job? And then it also tells us, you know, what jobs are we behind in market? What jobs do we need to start investing in? Because we're, because we're behind market, the market kind of like food service workers. Um, two years ago, you could get by with paying a food service worker $15. Now that is not the case. You can, you can probably expect to get, pay a food service worker anywhere between 19 to $20 an hour. So we have to take that into consideration. 
Um, are there any benefits people look for the most? So the major one, it's also the most expensive is health insurance. So, you know, if you don't have health insurance, it is incredibly, incredibly expensive if you need anything done, if anything unexpected happens. So of course, that is something that we promote heavily to our employees. And some people even work just for health insurance for their families, especially as you know, we're in a rural setting. So if there's, you know, one spouse at home farming, they don't have their own health insurance, or if they do, it's incredibly expensive. So they might have a spouse that goes in and works for Stanford or for another employer specifically for those benefits. Um, I would also just, you know, for my own um, retirement is very important because if you don't save for it, you don't get to retire. And then you're working at an unhealthy age and not able to take that time and, you know, enjoy your final years. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Under rewards. Um, what is the most important part of total rewards? I would say meeting the employee's needs. So all of us have individual needs, you know, where it might be important at a certain age to have family leave or you know maternity leave later on it might be more important to have short-term disability for you know if you have a hip surgery or something like that so just finding out what's important to our employees and then meeting that working in total rewards are the most important Our employees are taken care of after patients. Well, we need to be taken care of that already. Analyzing all the implementation total rewards program. So, obviously, everyone has like every company, they're going to set up with a total reward system. I think the most challenging part of the is challenges to understand the game change of life. So when you are moving from an old system to a new system, you really have to do your due diligence in communicating what that change is going to be and how it's going to be beneficial for the employee. What is going to be good about that change? Two separate conceptions of benefits based on child and I think we have to really dive into the next those the connection that we have with the family members. Um, so there are challenges that we work with in taking care of our employees, but there are also benefits. We have a lot of things that we do before those we do, so I'm hoping in the future um, for those to go over. Um, one more thing that I would add to that is at least at Stanford, Stanford is always going to be like, if we are not making budget, we're, they're going to be looking at every other way to save money. The absolute last place they're going to look for taking money away is in the total rewards. Because again, one of our um, pillars is people. We want to take care of our people. So that's going to be the last place we're going to take from is our people. Um, what do you need? to offer to become an employer of choice for the best talent. So obviously you're gonna want a rich full rewards program. You're gonna wanna have good benefits. You're gonna wanna have competitive um, wages for your job. But also a lot of that is also gonna come into um, company culture. 
yes, you can get good benefits and good compensation at a couple of place a couple of organizations. But for me, the reason why I choose to work at Sanford is because of the company culture. I mean, yes, we do have a very rich total rewards program, but also we have a very flexible um, schedules. We have work-life balance. Family is important to us. You know, you got to make sure that your family and your home is taken care of before you can come to work. Um, I actually just recently had ACL surgery and I never once felt that like I was pressured to get back to work. Like it was very much a comment to come up whenever you're ready. We're here when you have, um, we're happy to have you back, but don't worry. Our team has you while you're gone. Um, how do we incentivize, or how do we use incentive rewards other than money? So all benefits, you know, are an indirect reward. Uh, you know, until you're looking at it and then until you're 26, it's not going to be super important for you. You know, you're able to stay on your parents' insurance. Um, you can obviously, as soon as you get a job, you can go on their insurance if they offer it, but you can save money and stay on your parents as well. Um, but when you're looking at your total reward statement, which we offer, so it shows, you know, what's your base rate, which of course everyone knows. Um, and that's what you pay attention to most, it seems. But when you look at everything else, what are, what's my company paying for my health insurance? What are they putting towards my retirement? What are they paying for dental, a health savings account, vision, short-term disability, long-term disability? When you look at all of those, it significantly adds, um, you know, at a minimum, if you're enrolled in benefits, it's going to be close to 10,000 additional dollars that your company is investing in you. So when you're looking at jobs, you know, even if you don't think that you need to be enrolled in benefits now, look and make sure that they're offering it if you plan to be with them for a while. Um, because if you're having to take care of all those things on your own, even if they might have a higher base rate of pay, think about that and be like, okay, can, if I subtract $10,000 from that, am I still going to be happy with that salary? Um, and if you are great, but it's also going to be more expensive for you to get insurance individually than it would as a group. Think about like buying things in bulk, it's cheaper. So when there are more people in a plan, it's cheaper. So we are off, able to offer more affordable health insurance and you also have that employer paid portion, which is huge. Um, how is fairness and equity insured in the distribution of rewards and recognition? Um, we offer, I'll speak from the benefits side, of course, we offer the same benefits to all of our employees. So whether you're an environmental services employee or you're a surgeon, you're offered the same benefits, you're paying the same um, price for that. We don't, you know, just because someone's making more, we don't make them pay more for their benefits. It's the same benefit. Um, they're eligible for the same as it's benefit eligibility is based on employee status alone. So like if you're a part-time employee, you might not be eligible for as much where if you're full-time, then you have a whole gamut to choose from um, for rewards. Um, from a compensation standpoint, um, we have salary ranges. So any employee in working the same job, they're going to be the same. We're not going to be, we don't give employees so that's how we make sure that we know we're being fair and equitable across the board. Um, how can you hang on to your best people using total rewards? Is it a case by case basis or is there a limit? So typically, you're going to want to take it on a case by case basis because every situation is going to be different and every situation is going to have a different issue. So, um, and when you do take it on a case by case basis, you're going to want to keep in mind, you know, like, if I give this employee a retention bonus, our other employees going to come forward. So you do have to take it on a case by basis and then kind of back into a one size fits all. Today with the workforce you have now, what, what has been the best reward to encourage employees benefits, increased salary, words of affirmation, et cetera. So like I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, when you're making those choices, when employees are making the choice to come to work, to stay working for us and not look elsewhere, it's a whole lot more than just their base rate of pay and the benefits that we're offering. It's how they feel. It's, you know, do they feel like they're a valued employee? Um, are they being taken care of? Do they have a supportive team? And so I would say um, the recognitions with that we offer and that we allow employees to do and for their leaders to do, you know, colleagues to 
recognize you is huge because we have bad days. I know I created a folder years ago and I still add to it and look at it when I'm having bad days called like a feel good email. So when someone sends me like a huge thanks or, you know, something like that, an employee tells me the impact that I made on them, I put that in there because not all days are good days. And you need to go back and look and say, why am I here? Why am I showing up to work? Why do I love my job? And sometimes you need that reminder. Um, but, you know, getting that reminder from other people too is huge. So that would be for me. Um, and then is there a certain go-to reward that you think of when you're looking for different compensation and benefit situations? The go-to is going to be health insurance um, for the benefit side. All employees, not all employees, but the majority of employees care most about health insurance because that's the greatest cost. At some point, we're all going to need it. So you need to make sure that's a good reward. It's also All right. Um, what are situations in which you use rewards um, in Sanford specifically when as an employee isn't motivated trying to recruit employees? So at Sanford, um, we get a lot of discretion to the department. So we have a uh, we have a bunch of incentive codes. We have premiums. We have differentials. We have um, the option of bonuses. And we let the department decide how they want to use them and if they want to use them. Um, one of our incentive codes can range all the way from a $2.50. Um, so you get an extra $2.50 on all hours work. That could go all the way up to 100% premium, which means you're going to get your base rate of pay plus a 100% premium and all that. So. You also want to be careful with offering incentive codes because it's kind of like, you know, once you offer it, it's very hard to take that back. And once employees kind of like, you know, oh, I know if I wait um, until the last minute, they're going to just keep on upping that incentive because sometimes departments will start with, I'm going to offer you a 50% incentive if you're going to pick up the shift. And as time gets closer to that shift needing to be picked up, they're going to up that ante to 100%. So they know, employees know if you wait out, you're going to get a bigger incentive. So sometimes you got to be very careful with how, and how departments are using their incentive codes. But we also tell the department that, you know, it's your budget. you It's yours to use. So as long as you're staying within budget, you can use incentive codes, bonuses, retention um, bonuses as much as possible, as long as you're in budget. How do you analyze what rewards are worth it to employees? So as I mentioned earlier, we have 
quite a few vendors that we work with on the benefits side. So Marsha McLennan is who we use um, on the benefits part of the house for our health and welfare benefits. So they're helping us, you know, look and see what's available, what we can do, how we can make it the most efficient, most cost effective um, in order to meet our employees' needs. But the good and bad part about being part of such a large organization is, you know, we have to do this for 50,000 employees. It's not just, okay, it's really important. I want pet insurance. So let's give Cassie pet insurance. Well, we can't do that. We have to make it available to everyone. So although everyone's individual needs are important, we can't just make a case by case decision. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but benefits are pretty set in stone. We make changes to them once a year. You can't really negotiate them. Um, because you are getting that group rate. So you can't say, well, I only want to pay $50 a month for my health insurance. Your employer probably won't be able to do that. So where there are some gives, give and takes, um, most of the time you were kind of having to make decisions for the broad group. Um, and then, you know, listening to those individual requests and, you know, what's important to them helps us make those future decisions for the following years. doing? How are you dealing with your job? The more feedback we can get from them is good. Um, a couple years ago, we did an employee experience survey to know what we were talking about. You know, if we lowered our 401k match, would you, would you prefer that? You know, trying to make those money. What could we do? And also that helps to tell people, what do, what do we offer right now? Employees really like, and we our annual employee bonus is extremely valued by our um, by our employees. Um, Full time employees get three hundred a week. Part time employees get one fifty, and PRN employees get two hundred. So, from a business standpoint, we're thinking: Is it really that impactful to give our employees this bonus? But our employees, yes, we truly value that bonus. So we get. Do you find it easy to attract prospective clients by offering clients basic salary or better incentives? Um, I think offering incentives is good, but you know, with incentives, it's not as easy to get to know them. And what we find is that um, people are wanting a higher base salary. Well, This year, um, for 2020, we did do some changes to staff, so we decreased um, the full-time employee um, or FTE eligibility for benefits, but in doing so, we were able to make the benefit pay for costs and we were able to um, increase the employee benefit rate. And, you know, that's something that we're looking to make sure that doesn't affect the cost of benefits, which is something that we have to do to be able to keep our status. So that they didn't have to worry too much with the benefits, but for the greater good for the employees, they want to make sure that they were full. So it's difficult to kind of see after I might be, you know, what I'm going to be making off of some employees, but for the majority, it's going to be great. So it's always a difficult thing to kind of compare to the other employees. It's quite weird because I have staff who are making more money than me too, but they want to take it to the next level. They want to make some good decisions. So right now, like I mentioned earlier, we're going, Stanford's going through their market um, increases. So we have a 0.5% budget of, 
um, to implement increases, which is, I want to say, approximately 4 million in total. Right now, where we're sitting at with market increases is approximately 15 million. So that's like if we wanted to, if we wanted everything underneath the sun, you know, like we looked at our analysis and we were like, okay, we have to bring all these jobs up to market and even like operations, they would bring jobs to us saying like, we're struggling with hiring and security. We really want to look at our security um, and give them increases. So when you kind of take all of those jobs and how much it's going to cost to give increases, it's, it's a pretty large amount, but we only have 0.5% budget to work with. So where it gets complicated is saying, okay, well, all these jobs need a market increase, but what jobs are we hurting in the most? And what jobs do we need to invest in right now? I don't get to make that decision. Our executive team gets to make it, um, but it's, it's fun to work with our strategic partners to kind of like run data for them. So we're like, it's also kind of fun to where like, well, what if we gave 70% um, of range movement to our employees rather than 100%, what would that cost? Or what if we did 70%? So um 80 percent so it's it, there's a lot of back and forth but it's fun work in my opinion it's fun work how do you reward or how do total rewards differ depending on the industry does it at all um for example healthcare versus benefits at a bank so um i'll say that our like one of our primary employee groups is going to be nurses. So if we look at nurses versus bank employees, um, they're going to have similar lifestyles. They're going to have similar income. So for them, um, the rewards that they're needing are going to be quite similar. So we also offer similar benefits to that of a bank. Now within Stanford, as Michaela mentioned, Good Samaritan Society is beneath us. Um, the majority of long-term care facilities, which is Good Samaritan, um, have less benefits. So healthcare systems, banks, they have richer benefit total rewards packages as a whole where that long-term care, it's it's much less. And that's primarily going to be CNAs, um, medication aids, you know. Mm -hmm. Typically you don't need a degree for many of those positions, uh, which is why long-term care facilities typically offer lesser benefits. So as we mentioned earlier, we offer the same benefits to all of our employees. So for the most part, Good Samaritan employees are eligible for very similar benefits as um, those on the Sanford side of the house. So for us, it does not differ terribly. Um, but for other companies, like if you looked at another long-term care facility versus Sanford, it would be very, very different. As much as possible. Um, what is one thing um, all college students can do to help for future jobs? Um, along with, you know, getting experience, you're going to want to beef up your resume. But also, I think, I mean, Cassie and I both had internships, and it was a very seamless transition from internship to our 
careers. So I think getting any internship with any company that you're interested in working for is going to be extremely helpful because companies love to hire from within. So if you already have a foot in the door, that's just going to get, um, help increase your chances in getting a job. And to echo on that, a lot of times jobs are posted internally first. So as an intern, as you know, maybe you're taking an admin assistant job in order to, you know, get your foot in the door, but you'll have the chance to, you know, apply for that job before external parties and also get to know who's hiring for it and hear from other departments as well. Um, what base salary can I, ex can I expect for my first job out of college? So this is a difficult one, um, of course. So, you know, I'm sure you know, you can look online, but you've also probably seen, you know, Glassdoor, Indeed, they don't always have accurate information for our area. So for the Midwest, of course, we have a lower cost of living. So that also means that base rates of pay are less. As an example, I can tell you that both of our, and now it's becoming far more popular for um, positions or for jobs to post their salary range. Michaela kind of touched on what a salary range is before, but that's what an employer can offer you, um, you know, for that specific job. So, you know, if you don't have experience, if you're just out of college, you're probably going to be at the bottom of that. You don't have a whole lot of room to negotiate. Um, but as reference, what was my starting job at Sanford, which it's posted, but it was the starting rate salary was, or base rate was 2150 hourly. So, yeah. Um, a new job there's a best way to start um the best way to work for is by doing a job um i think when you're growing up you're going to start thinking like what do i want to do um, and what's my next job and then you can kind of look forward to looking at your resume and my work is paying for it and you might want to apply for that job and then that's what i can use my best advice is to just keep searching out for your next job absolutely pay attention to Um, do I always have to accept the salary that I'm given and how can I negotiate my salary as an employee? You can always negotiate. You do not have to accept the first um, offer that you're given. But again, when you're coming fresh out of college with, if you have little to no experience, your grounds for negotiation isn't going to be as big as someone who is coming who has probably five to 10 years of experience. Um, however, um, you can definitely negotiate. Um, well, an example that I always give is that, you know, as you can negotiate because if, as long as your negotiated um, salary is still the lowest and you are still coming in equitable within the department, that department might accept your negotiated salary. Never hurts to try. Mm -hmm. Um, is teamwork important nowadays? It is everything. If you're in any business role, you're going to have to work with others constantly, um, especially human resources. We touch all employees, so it's essential for us to be able to work with others effectively. Um, and finish off with advice that we would give to each of you. I would say just take your time. Take your time making that first job choice. It is huge um you know if you rush into it right away you might not be happy two months down the road and then you know you're going to be job hopping to another job and then if you don't take your time 
it's just going to keep happening until you finally find that long-term role. Perfect. You guys didn't get it on the radio. So our payroll is under finance, so we don't include that in human resources, but the largest HR percentage is going to be the talent acquisition or the recruiting team. Mm -hmm. um, because we have such a large um, company, there's always literally thousands of jobs open. So they're constantly trying to fill those. And especially like in um, lower level positions, there's a lot of turnover just naturally, not because there's something wrong with it, um, but so they're, they have the most. Um, repetitive mm -hmm. work, which is why they have the largest staff. Our department's only like 20 people. Yeah, a lot of it is going to be dependent on the organization. Um, we have a very lean um, organ like department for us. Um, we also have employee relations. You know, you're going to want to have as many people. Um, you're going to want to have someone in the Fargo market. You're going to want to have someone in the Bismarck market, the Bemidji market. Um, so probably a couple in the Sioux Falls market. We have South Health Network, the North Health Network. So you're probably going to have um, one to two employee relations per area because sometimes, you know, there's going to be a lot of work in there. So a lot of it depends on the workload, too, that comes with it. And like Kathy said, TA has the biggest workload. Mm -hmm. And then our administrative teams, I would say we have an HR admin team and employee service center. So those are the ones that, you know, take those initial employee questions. They look up, if you're a nurse, they make sure that your licensure is correct. Um, you know, all those kind of admin tasks are done at those levels. The annual employee bonus or the employee of the year does come with a bonus. And then you get a gift. Yeah, you get, I think it's like a thousand dollar bonus, and then you get a gift along with it. And then for the gratitude awards, you get a seventy five dollar gift card to like the fancy store. Cool little classic. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Any others? Yeah. Pleasure.